He might have said yes, but that didn't mean, Ross discovered, that he was to be shipped off at once to early Britain. Ashes tomorrow proved to be several days later. The cover was that of a beaker trader, and Ross's impersonation was checked again and again by experts, making sure that the last detail was correct and that no suspicion of a tribesman, no mistake on Ross's part would betray him. The Beaker people were an excellent choice for infiltration. They were not a closely knit clan, suspicious of strangers and alert to any deviation from the norm, as more race conscious tribes might be. For they lived by trade, leaving to Ross's own time the mark of their far flung empire in the Beakers found in graves scattered in clusters of a handful or so from the Rhineland to Spain, and from the Balkans to Britain. They did not depend only upon the taboo of the trade road for their safety for the Beakermen were master bowmen. A roving people, they pushed into new territory to establish posts, living amicably among peoples with far different customs, the Downs farmers, horse herders, shoreside fisherfolk. With Ash, Ross passed a last inspection. Their hair had not grown long enough to require braiding, but they did have enough to hold it back from their faces with height headbands. The kilt tunics of coarse material, duplicating samples brought from the past, were harsh to the skin and poorly fitting. But the workmanship of their link and plate bronze belts, the sleek bow guards strapped to their wrists, and the bows themselves approached fine art. Ash's round cloak was the blue of a master trader, and he wore wealth in a necklace of polished wolf's teeth alternating with amber beads. Ross's more modest position in the tribe was indicated not only by his red-brown cloak, but by the fact that his personal jewelry consisted only of a copper bracelet and a cloak pin with a jet head. He had no idea how the time transition was to be made, nor how one might step from the polar regions of the Western Hemisphere to the island of Britain lying off the eastern. And it was a complicated business as he discovered. The transition itself was a fairly simple, though disturbing, process. One walked a short corridor and stood for an instant on a plate while the light centered there curled about in a solid core, shutting one off from floor and wall. Ross gasped for breath as the air was sucked out of his lungs. He experienced a moment of deathly sickness with the sensation of being lost in nothingness. Then he breathed again and looked through the dying wall of light to where Ash waited. Quick and easy as the trip through time had been, the journey to Britain was something else. There could be only one transfer point if the secret was to be preserved. But men from that point must be moved swiftly and secretly to their appointed stations. Ross, knowing the strict rules concerning the transportation of objects from one time to another, wondered how that travel could be affected. After all, they could not spend months, or even years, getting across continents and seas. The answer was ingenious. Three days after they had stepped through the barrier of time at the outpost, Ross and Ash balanced on the rounded back of a whale. It was a whale which would deceive anyone who did not test its hide with a harpoon, and whalers with harpoons large enough to trouble such a monster were yet well in the future. Ash slid a dugout into the water, and Ross climbed into that unsteady craft, holding it against the side of the disguised sub until his partner joined him. The day, misty and drizzling, made the shore they aimed for a half-seen line across the water. With a shiver born of more than cold, Ross dipped his paddle and helped Ash send their crude boat toward that half-hidden strip of land. There was no real dawn, the sky lightened somewhat, but the drizzle continued. Green patches showed among the winter denuded trees back from the beach, but the countryside facing them gave an impression of untamed wilderness. Ross knew from his briefing that the whole of Britain was as yet only sparsely settled. The first wave of hunter-fishers to establish villages had been joined by other invaders who built massive tombs and had an elaborate religion. Small village forts had been linked from hill to hill by trackways. There were factories, which turned out in bulk such fine flint weapons and tools that a thriving industry was in full operation, not yet having been superseded by the metal imported by the beaker merchants. Bronze was still so rare and costly that only the headman of a village could hope to own one of the long daggers. Even the arrowheads in Ross's quiver were chipped of flint. 
They drew the dugout well up onto the shore and ran it into a shallow depression in the bank, heaping stones and brush about for its concealment. Then Ash intently surveyed the surrounding country, seeking a landmark. Inland from here. Ash used the language of the beakerman, and Ross knew that from now on he must not only live as a traitor, but also think as one. All other memories must be buried under the false one he had learned, he must be interested in the present rate of exchange and the chance for profit. The two men were on their way to Outpost Gog, where Ash's first partner, the redoubtable Sanford, was playing his role so well. The rain squished in their hide boots, made sodden strings of their cloaks, plastered their woven caps to their thick mats of hair. Yet Ash bore steadily on across the land with the certainty of one following a marked trail. His self-confidence was rewarded within the first half-mile when they came out upon one of the link trackways, its beaten surface testifying to constant use. Here Ash turned eastward, stepping up the pace to a ground-covering trot. The peace of the road held, at least by day. By night only the most hardened and desperate outlaws would brave the harmful spirits roving in the dark. All the lore that had been pounded into him at the base began to make some sense to Ross as he followed his guide, sniffing strange wet smells from the brush, the trees, and the damp earth, piecing together in his mind what he had been taught and what he now saw for himself, until it made a tight pattern. The track they were following sloped slightly upward, and a change in the wind brought to them a sour odor, blanking out all normal sense. Ash halted so suddenly that Ross almost plowed into him. But he was alerted by the older man's attitude. Something had been burned. Ross drew in a deep lungful of the smell and then wished that he had not. It was wood burned wood and something else. Since this was not possibly normal, he was prepared for the way ash melted into cover in the brush. They worked their way, sometimes crawling on their bellies, through the wet stands of dead grass, taking full advantage of all cover. They crouched at the top of the hill while ash parted the prickly branches of an evergreen bush to make them a window. The black patch left by the fire, which had come from a ruin above, had spread downhill on the opposite side of the valley. Charred posts still stood like lone teeth in a skull to mark what must have once been one of the stockade walls of a post. But all they now guarded was a desolation from which came that overpowering stench. Our post? Ross asked in a whisper. Ash nodded. He was studying the scene with an intent absorption which, Ross knew, would impress every important detail upon his mind. That the place had been burned was clear from the first. But why and by whom was a problem vital to the two lurking in the brush? It took them almost an hour to cross the valley, an hour of hiding, casting about, searching. They had made a complete circle of the destroyed post and Ash stood in the shadow of a copse, rubbing clots of mud from his hands and frowning up at the charred posts. They weren't rushed. Or if they were, the attackers covered their trail afterward, Ross ventured. The older man shook his head. Tribesmen would not have muddled a trail if they had one. No, this was no regular attack. There have been no signs of a war party coming or leaving. Then what? demanded Ross. Lightning for one thing, and we'd better hope it was that. Or Ash's blue eyes were very cold and bleak, as cold and bleak as the countryside about them. Or, Ross dared to prompt him. Or we have made contact with the Reds in the wrong way. Ross's hand instinctively went to the dagger at his belt. Little help a dagger would be in an unequal struggle like this. They were only two in a thin web of men strung out through centuries of time with orders to seek out that which did not fit properly into the pattern of the past, to locate the enemy wherever in history or prehistory he had gone to earth. Had the Reds been searching, too, and was this first disaster their victory? The time traders had their evidence when they at last ventured into what had been the heart of Outpost Gog. 
Ross, inexperienced as he was in such matters, could not mistake the signs of the explosion. There was a crater on the crown of the hill, and ash stood apart from it, eyeing the fragments about them, scorched wood, blackened stone. The Reds? It must have been. This damage was done by explosives. It was clear why Outpost God could not report the disaster. The attack had destroyed their one link with the post on this time level. The concealed communicator had gone up with the blast. Eleven Ash's finger tapped on the ornate buckle of his wide belt. We have about ten days to stick it out, he added and it seems we may be able to use them to better advantage than just letting you learn how it feels to walk about some 4,000 years before you were born. We have to find out if we can what happened here and why. Ross gazed at the mess. Dig, he asked. Some digging is indicated. So they dug. Finally, black with charcoal smudges and sick with the evidences of death they had chanced upon, they collapsed on the cleanest spot they could find. They must have hit at night, Ash said slowly. Only at that time would they find everyone here. Men don't trust a night filled with ghosts, and our agents conform to local custom as usual. All of the post people could be erased with one bomb at night. All except two of them had been true beaker traders, including women and children. No beaker trading post was large, and this one was unusually small. The attacker had wiped out some twenty people, eighteen of them innocent victims. How long ago? Ross wanted to know. Maybe two days. And this attack came without any warning, or Sandy would have sent a message. He had no suspicions at all, his last reports were all routine, which means that if they were on to him, and they must have been, judging by the results, he was not even aware of it. What do we do now? Ash looked at him. We wash, no, he corrected himself, we don't. We go to Nodrin's village. We are frightened, grief-stricken. We have found our kinsman dead under strange circumstances. We ask questions of one to whom I am known as an inhabitant of this post. So, covered with dirt, they walked along the trackway toward the neighboring village with a weariness they did not have to counterfeit. The dog sighted or perhaps scented them first. It was a rough-coated beast, showing its fangs with a wolf-like ferocity. But it was smaller than a wolf, and it barked between its warning snarls. Ash brought his bow from beneath the shelter of his cloak and held it ready. Ho, oh, one comes to speak with Nodrun, Nodrun of the hill. Only the dog snapped and snarled. Ash rubbed his forearm across his face, the gesture of a weary and heartsick man, smearing the ash and grime into an awesome mask. Who speaks to Nodrun? There was a different twist to the pronunciation of some words but Ross was able to understand. One who has hunted with him and feasted with him. The one who gave into his hand the friendship gift of the ever-sharp knife. It is Asha of the traitors. Go far from us, man of ill luck. You who are hunted by the evil spirits. The last was a shrill cry. Ash remained where he was, facing into the bushes which hid the tribesmen. Who speaks for Nodrun yet not with the voice of Nodrun, he demanded. This is Asha who asks. We have drunk blood together and faced the white wolf and the wild boar in their fury. Nodrun lets not others speak for him, for Nodrun is a man and a chief. And you are cursed. A stone flew through the air striking a rain pool and spattering mud on Ash's boots. Go and take your evil with you. Is it from the hand of Nodrun or Nodrun's young men that doom came upon those of my blood? Have war arrows passed between the place of the traitors and the town of Nodrun? 
Is that why you hide in the shadows so that I, Asha, cannot look upon the face of one who speaks boldly and throws stones? No war arrows between us, traitor. We do not provoke the spirits of the hills. No fire comes from the sky at night to eat us up with the noise of many thunders. Lurga speaks in such thunders, Lurga's hand smites with such fire. You have the wrath of Lurga upon you, traitor. Keep away from us lest Lurga's wrath fall upon us also. Lurga was the local storm god, Ross recalled. The sound of thunder and fire coming out of the sky at night, the bomb. Perhaps the very method of attack on the post would defeat Asha's attempt to learn anything from these neighbors. The superstitions of the people would lead them to shun both the sight of the post and Ash himself as cursed and taboo. If the wrath of Lurga had struck at Asha, would Asha still live to walk upon this road? Ash prodded the ground with the tip of his bowstave. Yet Asha walks, as you see him, Asha talks, as you hear him. It is ridiculous to answer him with the nonsense of little children. Spirits so walk and talk to unlucky men, retorted the man in hiding. It may be the spirit of Asha who does so now. Ash made a sudden leap. There was a flurry of action behind the bush screen and he reappeared, dragging into the gray light of the rainy day a wriggling captive, whom he bumped without ceremony onto the beaten earth of the road. The man was bearded, wearing his thick mop of black hair and a round topknot secured by a hide loop. He wore a skin tunic, now in considerable disarray, which was held in place with a woven, tasseled belt. Ho, oh, so it is Lull of the Quick Tongue who speaks so loudly of spirits and the wrath of Lurga. Ash studied his captive. Now, Lull, since you speak for Nodrin, which I believe will greatly surprise him, you will continue to tell me of this wrath of Lurga from the night skies and what has happened to Sanfra, who was my brother, and those others of my kin. I am Asha, and you know of the wrath of Asha and how it ate up Twist Tooth, the outlaw, when he came in with his evil men. The wrath of Lurga is hot, but so too was the wrath of Asha. Ash contorted his face in such a way that Lull squirmed and looked away. When the tribesman spoke, all his former authority and bluster had gone. Asha knows that I am as his dog. Let him not turn upon me his swift-cutting big knife, nor the arrows from his lightning bow. It was the wrath of Lurga which smote the place on the hill, first the thunder of his fist meeting the earth, and then the fire which he breathed upon those whom he would slay. And this you saw with your own eyes, lol? The shaggy head shook an emphatic negative. Asha knows that Lal is no chief who can stand and look upon the wonders of Lurga's might and keep his eyes in his head. Nodrin himself saw this wonder. And if Lurga came in the night, when all men keep to their homes and leave the outer world to the restless spirits, how did Nodrin see his coming? Lal crouched lower to the ground, his eyes darting to the bushes and the freedom they promised then back to Ash's firmly planted boots. I am not a chief, Asha. How could I know in what way or for what reason Nodrin saw the coming of Lurga? Fool! A second voice, that of a woman, spat the word from the brush which fringed the roadway. Speak to Asha with a straight tongue. If he is a spirit, he will know that you do not tell him the truth. And if he has been spared by Lurga. She showed her wonderment with a hiss of indrawn breath. So urged, Lal mumbled sullenly, it is said that there came a message for one to witness the wrath of Lurga in its descent upon the outlanders so that Nodrin and the men of Nodrin would truly know that the traitors were cursed and should be put to the spear should they come here again. This message, how was it brought? Did the voice of Lurga sound in Nodrin's ear alone, or came it by the tongue of some man? Ah he! Lal lay flat on the ground, his hands over his ears. Lal is a fool and fears his own shadow as it skips before him on a sunny day. Out of the bushes stepped a young woman, obviously of some importance in her own group. Walking with a proud stride, 
her eyes boldly met Ash's. A shining disc hung about her neck on a thong, and another decorated the woven belt of her cloth tunic. Her hair was bound in a thread net fastened with jet pins. I greet Casca, who is the first sower. There was a formal note in Asha's voice. But why should Casca hide from Asha? There has been death on your hill, Asha, she sniffed, you smell of it now, Lurga's death. Those who come from that hill may well be some who no longer walk in their bodies. Casca placed her fingers momentarily on Asha's outstretched palm before she nodded. No spirit are you, Asha, for all know that a spirit is solid to the eye, but not to the touch. So it would seem that you were not burned up by Lurga, after all. This matter of a message from Lurga, he prompted. It came out of the empty air in the hearing not only of Nadrun, but also of Hanger, Fr, and myself, Casca. For we stood at that time near the old place. She made a curious gesture with the fingers of her right hand. It will soon be the time of sowing and though Lurga brings sun and rain to feed the grain, yet it is in the great mother that the seed lies. Upon her business only women may go into the inner circle. She gestured again. But as we met to make the first sacrifice there came music out of the air such as we have never heard, voices singing like birds in a strange tongue. Her face assumed an awesome expression. Afterward a voice said that Lurga was angered with the hill of the men from afar and that in the night he would send his wrath against them, and that Nodrin must witness this thing so that he could see what Lurga did to those he would punish. So it was done by Nodrin. And there was a sound in the air. What kind of a sound? Ash asked quietly. Nodrin said it was a hum and there was the dark shadow of Lurga's bird between him and the stars. Then came the smiting of the hill with thunder and lightning, and Nodrin fled, for the wrath of Lurga is a fearsome thing. Now do the people come to the great mother's place with many fine offerings that she may stand between them and that wrath. Asha thanks Kaska, who is the handmaiden of the great mother. May the sowing prosper and the reaping be good this year. Ash said finally, ignoring Lal, who still groveled on the road. You go from this place, Asha, she asked. For though I stand under the protecting hand of the mother and so do not fear, yet there are others who will raise their spears against you for the honor of Lurga. We go, and again thanks be to you, Kaska. He turned back the way they had come and Ross fell in beside him as the woman watched them out of sight. 